I made a very aggressive and insanely designed puzzle so I could glitter bomb the shit out of Mark Rober. I mean, I made a puzzle box with a friendly little gift inside. Also, pneumatics. Let me explain. This here is a puzzle. It is a kinetic feat of late night engineering with five different puzzle solves, pneumatics, electronics, magnetism, and inside of it is a gift. And a whole lot of glitter. If you're still like, what is this girl talking about? Here is 30 seconds of background. If you are an internet dweller, you like science, and you haven't been living under a rock, you've probably heard of a guy named Mark Rover. He's made some, you know, pretty good YouTube videos that have done okay. And he may or may not have contributed to a piece of equipment currently on another planet. But enough about his accomplishments already. What I want to talk to you about is this guy running around glitter bombing people. And look, he hath always glitter bombed with the utmost integrity. People who steal other people's packages or who scam those who are most vulnerable, f those people. But while Mark has always made sure to only glitter bomb those who deserve it, I, fortunately, do not suffer from such scruples. Bernard! Really, at the end of the day, I just started to think that someone needs to give Mark a taste of his own medicine. So do you know what questions started keeping me up at night? Searing into my mind? Who glitter bombs the glitter bomber? My task was set. I clearly had no other option but to create a five-sided, custom-welded, gift-carrying, Raspberry Pi-run, Python-activated, mechanically-engineered, pneumatics-filled puzzle that would glitter bomb Mark Rober if he proved himself unworthy. AKA, I would send him a puzzle box, and if he couldn't figure it out in time... Now that you have the background, I'm going to take you through the basics and gameplay of this puzzle. This project was supposed to be a small little puzzle box but I ended up basically creating an inside-out escape room because apparently I am physically incapable of not being the most at all times. And just to add in a little bit of nerd flavor, each side of this puzzle represents one letter in Steam. Try and guess what they are as we move through the puzzle. Each side has its own unique solve, but I wanted there to be a cohesive gameplay that helped inform the user experience. It's a gear system. <laughs> I decided to design the puzzle around assembling a gear system. Every time you solve a side of the puzzle, you get rewarded with a gear. Something like a raven would understand, but I wouldn't, you know. Once you have solved all of the puzzles and collected all of the gears, you can fully assemble this gear system, which will then crank down an arrow that presses a big deactivate button, and pressing that button will save Mark from glitter attack. Maybe, I mean, you know, unless something accidentally misfires or something. Now let's work our way through the puzzle. starts with a centripetal force puzzle. I designed an oversized saw energy gift tag saying, let's get started, safely assuming that would be enough of a clue to get Mark started on that side. I'm psychologically damaged. <laughs> to underscore the bomb energy of the puzzle, I attach this tag to a grenade pin that, when pulled from this custom 3D printed part, releases a button and triggers the scripts running the puzzle. And my voice comes on a speaker and says, all right, let's do this. You've got 15 minutes. Good luck. Wait, 15 minutes? Making this was incredibly complicated, but after many tries, it worked perfectly. And it was absolutely hilarious in all of my user testing. Centripetal force is a physics term that describes a force that acts on a body moving in a circular path and is directed towards the center around which the body is moving. This puzzle, when spun, releases a small gear as the ball bearings roll to the side. Oh my god, it works! <laughs> it's a perfect puzzle for Mark because I want to challenge him to apply his knowledge of science and engineering in order to solve each side. To help give clues for this solve, I left the gear and ball bearings visible through the paint, and I purchased an overly large swivel that would act as a clue that it needs to be spun. This first gear will hopefully establish the gameplay and Mark will realize that his goal is to collect all of the gears so he will be able to press the deactivate button. 
Fun fact, there seems to be no consensus as to whether this type of puzzle represents centripetal or centrifugal force. So I texted my friend Diana, who also happens to be the arbiter of all that is physics, physics girl, and asked her which one it was. To help lead Mark into the next phase of the puzzle solve, I painted lines onto the gear and around the axle where that gear needed to go. Hidden where the gear gets placed is a small button that gets compressed as the gear slides onto the axle. It activates a relay that triggers a servo and a sound effect and a door pops open. I've now trained Mark to know that whenever he hears that sound, somewhere a door is popped open. And it is one of the many ways I am cluing him into what the next step is. If Mark isn't able to finish this puzzle without getting a glitter shower, I wanna make sure it's because it took him too long, not because the puzzle was in any way confusing or lacked consistent logic. Basically, it's on, Mark. Maybe like 20% less. I know. He has done nothing to deserve this. Inside the now open door is another gear prize, a map, a viewfinder labeled Shake Me, and a black light flashlight. I put the flashlight behind that door as his next main clue. If someone gives you a black light flashlight, you turn it on and you point it at things until you see whatever it is they want you to see. It is the way. Also, this puzzle looks super awesome under black light. <laughs> Rave glitter bomb. Sooner or later, Mark will shine the light on the top of the puzzle and he will see diagrams that match the diagrams on the map. By the way, here's a close-up of the map because it is awesome and it teases a bloody handprint. If you are going to make a treasure map, it must have a bloody handprint. Map is blood. The shape and scale of the diagrams matches the viewfinder and boom, number revealed. While I was making the lid of the puzzle, I inlay rare earth magnets in the shape of numbers. I then painted and ripped up papers to texture the top of the puzzle and make it look the way I wanted to, but also to make sure that the magnets would read clearly. That viewfinder is actually filled with silicone and iron filings. The iron filings are pulled towards the magnets, revealing the number. In my third video of this series, which will dive deeper into the making, science, and design process, I'm going to tell you all about how I was deeply traumatized by trying to make gear viewfinders but for now, just know that this viewfinder worked beautifully. I use nine as one of the numbers to make sure that I keep Mark on his toes. If he pays close attention to the design, he will clearly know it's a nine because it has an asymmetric vertical orientation. But if he moves too fast and doesn't look carefully, he might think it's a six. It's a feature, not a bug. This is what we tell ourselves to get through. Once he knows that X equals three, y equals seven and z equals nine, the likely move will be to go over to the side of the puzzle that has numbers on it. The logical next step will be to put in the three numbers. So with the help of my brilliant electronics wizard Jason and programming wizard Sinclair, more about that rockstar team at the end of this video, I programmed in a couple of variations. Three, seven, nine led to my voice saying, Nice try Mark, but too easy. What? <laughs> Any other combination of numbers and my voice said, nice try, Mark. Swipe your ID card to reset the number pad. I'm sorry. And then after two incorrect entries of that, it said, okay, fine, I'll give you a clue. I would look a little bit closer at that ID card. And it's probably a good time to give you a closer peek as well. Yup. Math. Is, is this equation part of the puzzle? Oh my goodness. You will be glad to know that every single person who went through this puzzle was like, are you kidding me? Oh, I gotta do fucking math. The universal affront. It was great. And I even provided him with a little calculator so he could really have that cookie nibbled by a French novelist flashback to elementary school. This solve was fun because you won't know if you've solved the equation right until you type the numbers into the number pad. And that in-between moment of anticipation played incredibly well. Okay. I feel like it should be known that I'm giving you the out of using a calculator, so the time you're taking up doing this, okay, give me a if you get glitter bombed, is now officially not my fault. That's all I'm saying. So have you solved it yet? Five, eight, one. 
Ladies, gentlemen, and assembled aliens, we have a winner. A new door has popped open. First thing you will find upon opening the door is another gear prize that hopefully Mark will see he still needs to save for later. Of course, if he wants to waste precious time trying to solve that side of the puzzle, even when he doesn't have all of the gears, that is fine by me. As Mark looks at this face of the puzzle, he will see that there is a marble, there is a glowing button, and there is a physical barrier that is preventing the marble from rolling down and hitting that button. His goal is clear, somehow remove the barrier. Oh wow. There is a patch bay and cables taped onto the door, but the possibilities are many, so I had to design in a clue. I use my four years of education at an elite art school to script this next clue in careful calligraphy around the door. To hide the answer for the patch bay, I used thermochromic paint, AKA paint that will change color or opacity when heat is applied. This paint is so cool, although it definitely took some trial and error to figure out how to apply it and which heat to use. Hopefully, Mark will see this and be like, but it's not hot. And then he'll use his big brain and be like, maybe I should make it hot. Basically, as you all might know, fire is kind of my jam. And I really wanted Mark to have to play with flames at some point during this puzzle. I even packed him some band-aids and burn cream in his solve kit, just in case. I labeled the wires with X, Y, Z, and I wrote the corresponding numbers on the door. This way, Mark, if he gets this far, we'll have to think back and remember which numbers match to which letters. Once the patch bay is plugged in, it activates a relay that runs a live current for 10 seconds through the wire connected at the other end of the seesaw. Oh my god, yes! <laughs> This wire is an amazing material called nitinol wire, sometimes referred to as shape memory wire. I trained this particular piece of wire to remember a spring shape, and when heated up to a specific temperature, it returns to that spring shape. So freaking cool! For a deep dive into the science behind this incredible reversible state transformation, come back for video three in this series. For now, when the patch bay is solved, the wire magically contracts, lifts up the barrier, and the marble rolls down and hits the button. Yeah! Doors open! The final door pops open, and inside are the last two gears, one with a hex axle attached to it. There are enough clues from gear size, axle depth, and the careful placement of the first gears to make it possible to solve this side. I had originally thought of adding fake out axles to make it even harder, but as it was, this gear system started off as a near impossible solve, and I had to make it a little bit more clear. I can do my own puzzle. <laughs> That's my dance. Sleep is important. There were two possibilities programmed into the pneumatic script. One was a fail state. If 15 minutes passed and the deactivate button wasn't pressed, then the glitter bomb would be triggered. The other was a success state. If, within 15 minutes, Mark pressed the button, then a door on the top of the box would release, and he would be rewarded with his gift inside the box. And also, you know, not getting glitter bombed. I wanted my glitter bomb to have its own unique flavor. Mark went for the sideways, let's make things messy, but I just wanted to go big. As I was getting at before, subtlety, not really a strong suit of mine. Like, I admire subtlety, just like from afar. So I wanted a big, bold explosion, but I also had to design the system so that it could go off no matter where Mark was in the puzzle solve. I decided I would hide the glitter bomb mechanism into the structure of the puzzle itself. This was one of the reasons I ended up accidentally making this a freestanding, very aggressive decahedron, as opposed to any of the infinite number of more reasonable options for this design. And I emptied out a fire extinguisher to use as my compressed air tank. I've worked with pneumatics before in some of my experiential design work, and it's only been a couple of years since I've worked with them, so I feel really confident in how safe this is. Cranking down the arrow, don't want to get glitter bombed, but also like, check it out. The height on this thing is crazy. I 
I'm gonna be real with you. The glitter bomb itself was possibly the main victim of the glitter bomb. That is to say, after my apartment and me. There is glitter everywhere. Like, it would have been great if it had been just like a little bit more consensual, but I mean, you know, cool, cool. Come back next week to see how Mark measures up against my puzzle. Will he be glitter bombed? Or, and, will my glitter bomb even work? Like, will it explode, but not in the way it's supposed? Not that I'm worried about that happening. In addition to Jason and Sinclair, Miranda is my brain trust producer. Hello? I live here too. <laughs> it looks like a bomb went off in it. So don't worry, Mark, you're in good hands. See you next week.